Psalms chapter number 8. I'm going to begin at verse number 4. The Bible says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest them to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou puttest all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now, you can look at the caption for this number chapter. you find out that David wrote this psalm. And truly, verse number 5 is where we're going to take the thought today. But what David's talking about is, Lord, out of everything that you made, you picked man to have dominion, to have rule over everything else that you made. I mean, we can go over to the book of Job, where God mentions the Leviathan to Job. And he says, the Leviathan doesn't worry what it's going to eat, but it's the biggest, baddest thing on the earth. But yet man picked Adam in the garden to have dominion over the Leviathan. Look, verse number 8 says, The fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. What's that mean? Anything in the water? What does the fowl of the air, what's that mean? Anything that flies? Right, he said, all the beasts of the field. He said, Lord, you had your pick of everything, including the things that we've never seen, that they dig up fossils of. Right, God could have picked any of them, but he said, no man. David's saying, what is man that thou art mindful of? We're no better than anything else. It's all the work of your hand. It's all beautiful. It's all lovely because God does all things well. He says, so why did you pick man? Then he goes one step further, and the son of man that thou visitest him. He's saying, you picked man. Well, who was the first man? Adam. To have dominion over all the earth. He says, and what is the son of man? Who's that? That's all of us. That thou visitest him. Now note, the son of man never was in the Garden of Eden. Cain, Abel, Seth, they were never in the Garden of Eden. They never knew what it was to walk in the cool of the day with the Lord. But yet, the Son of Man has a visitation from the Almighty, the Lord. This is David we're talking about. The one who God overshadowed with the Holy Ghost. Right? Didn't indwell him because he wasn't saved yet like New Testament talk. Right? He still had to be washed under the blood like all of us. But God overshadowed him. What did he do? He'd send men of God by his way. To do what? To have the word of the Lord visit David. They say, but it's, can't even understand why you think about us. They say, what is man that thou art mindful of him? But yet, he goes one step further, that thou would visit us, him. He says, you send your word just for me. Because it was David. He understood the great importance of the word of the Lord. He recorded some of it. His son recorded some of it. Right, the prophets recorded what they told David. Why? Because the word of the Lord is very important. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. David said, you visit us. Not just think about us. The great mystery to this day why God would choose to love us, let alone want to spend time with us, let alone even think about us. But the thought we're going to take today, as we've already said, verse number 5. This is man's position. For thou, God, hast made him, man, a little lower than the angels. That's all. This is where we go off the deep end. Y'all going to have to follow me. Okay, back in the garden. Before there was a garden, before there was an earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Sometime in between then and verse number 2 of Genesis 1-1, God set in order everything in heaven. His throne, as the Bible tells us, is in the sides of the north. Now, God made heaven and earth, but He set everything up in heaven when He made it. Because the Bible says that the earth was without form, it was void, for a while it was there, but it wasn't anything yet. 
So as God's making everything in heaven, he makes angels. Well, what are angels? Well, they're not holy. Angels sing about how holy God is. That's the seraphim. The cherubim. Them bad dudes that you don't want to mess with. Because one of them dudes threw thousands in one night. But one of those guys did all that, but yet the cherubim, multiple, guard the throne of God. To show what? That nobody but God can sit up on God's throne. They couldn't even try to walk up the steps to God's throne because they're not worthy, but they know anything that's not God isn't worthy to go up them steps. You've got the archangels, Michael and Gabriel that we hear about. They're the messengers of God. What is their duty? To take a holy word from a holy God and deliver it to who God told them to deliver it to. Right? But God set all that in order before the earth. So can we agree today angels aren't holy? God's holy. But if angels were holy, then Lucifer never could have betrayed God and become Satan. Right? We've got to define what holy is. What's holy? Perfection. It is righteousness, holiness. To be holy is to be holy with nothing else. Right? Holy, H-O-L-Y, means to be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, perfect. Without error, without void, nothing missing. What is it? It's an omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful God. That is what holiness is. An angel can't be holy because it was created to do a job. We don't sing about the holiness of angels because right? they're not holy. There's one that's holy. Who's that? Jehovah God. Right? But yet, then below angels, you know, God said, let there be light on the first day that I guess ever was recorded because before that, God didn't have a time scale. But after he made light, he said that was the end of the first day. So the first day ever ends. Then he goes on to create all the stars. and the, you know He makes all the trees of the earth with their fruit in their trees. What's that mean? That they can keep growing? Then he gets to the beast. Then he makes Adam. And according to Psalm chapter number 8, verse number 5, Adam was made a little lower than the angels. Adam couldn't go up into heaven. God made Adam to be on earth. We do know that if we didn't have sin-cursed eyes that could only see the carnal, we could look up into heaven and see angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth. They can go to more than one plane. We can. We can spend a whole lot of money and go to the moon, but guess what? God's throne's a whole lot farther than that. Can't get there with this. Man's made a little bit lower than the angels. But yet, I don't find where God walked in the cool of the day with the angels. Because Adam couldn't go to where God was, but God came to visit Adam. Be friends with him. But then, nowhere do I find, after Adam's made, that angels come down to heaven Got seraphim, two wings cover their face, two wings cover their feet, two they fly. Don't see them flying around Adam singing about how he's holy. Adam was just supposed to be what God wanted him to be. Now see, I don't know where the thought came from that Adam in the garden was just like God. That's not what the Bible says. If Adam was just like God, he'd have been Jesus. And if he was Jesus, he would have been holy. Adam was just man. A little bit lower than the angels. You know, if Adam had never sinned, you know where Adam would have lived for all of eternity? On the earth. Wouldn't have lived in heaven. He'd have lived in the Garden of Eden where God put him in order to be over all the beasts of the field, to maintain the garden. Nowadays, where's the Garden of Eden? It's destroyed long ago. Because of sin, God reshaped the earth in Noah's day. What happened to the garden? People look, where's the Garden of Eden? Gone. The flood destroyed it. God took it back and did whatever he wanted to with it. That was God's garden that man had defiled. 
What are you saying, Brother Joe? Adam wasn't holy. Was he sinless? Absolutely, until he sinned. But even when he was sinless, he didn't have no halo. He wasn't walking up and having conversations with God in heaven when he wanted. No, the Creator came down to the creation when the Creator desired it. He didn't get to dictate when he went and saw God. He knew, that's God and I'm Adam. God's greater than Adam. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? We're getting there. His father went Man a little bit lower than the angels. Angels aren't holy. Man wasn't holy even in a sinless, perfect garden. He was what God created him. Made him in God's image. But what's that mean, Brother Jordan? I believe that God's got a face, two eyes, a nose with two holes in it. Right? A mouth, two ears, hair, two arms, two legs. Why? Because I believe he made man in his image. But man was not a copy of God. That would have been God. He can only have one God. So who is Jesus? God. But God in flesh. Okay, so let's go. Let's jump ahead. You know, about 4,000 years. Roughly. When Jesus comes. What does the Bible say? That he became like us. He took on a robe of flesh so that we could put on a crown of righteousness one day. He became like us to redeem a kinsman under the law of the kinsman redeemer. And he could do that because back in the line, there's two, Rahab and Ruth. But who was Rahab? Well, she wasn't an Israelite. And who was Ruth? She's a Gentile. Guess what happens because of those two in God's family tree well Jesus' family tree he can redeem anybody that's not an Israelite and anybody that's a Gentile who's that everybody the Jews and everybody else but why because he became like us he had to put on unholiness in the flesh right this carnal thing he was robed in that just for a little bit it hid his glory Right? He chose not to show how holy and righteous and perfect He really was. Not for His sake, but for our sake. For 33 and a half years, He conquered and had dominion over the flesh and was sinless. Why? So that His perfect, sinless blood could pay for the cost of our... be the propitiation for our sin, as the Bible said. Well, then now, skip ahead... I don't know when y'all got saved. Let's just say about 1950 years or so. Okay, skip ahead. You get saved. Whatever day that was, whenever it was. What happened at that moment? Well, the blood was applied. Your sins, gone. Right? Not hidden, not erased, as if they never were. The Bible says that we were robed in His righteousness because we had no righteousness of our own. He made you a new creature who the end product of that new creature is, I don't know what we're going to be like when we see Him, but I know we're going to be like Him. That's the end product of the new creature. But guess where that new creature gets to dwell for all of eternity? Heaven. Guess what we get to do whenever we desire He's made me a priest that I can enter directly into the throne room of God. I can walk into the throne room of heaven through the Spirit by faith and talk to God whenever I desire. Adam didn't get to do that. Guess where Adam would have stayed all of his days? In a green garden on a green earth that was perfect just as God had intended it to be. But he couldn't have gone anywhere else. Personally, I don't believe he desired to go anywhere else. He was happy where God wanted him to be until he realized that Eve was going to get kicked out of the garden and he wanted Eve more than he wanted God. What are we saying, Brother Jordan? Christ didn't come to save us to take us back to what we were supposed to be. What were we supposed to be? We were supposed to be in the garden. We were supposed to be tenders of the vineyard. We were supposed to be husbandmen of what God has created. 
But see, when Jesus purposed to save us, He said, but Father, because I love them, I don't want them to just be what they started out as. Adam was sinless. Adam had a perfect body, had complete use of his mind, his body. There were no limitations by sin, by time, by age. Adam was a miraculous thing that was made. But Jesus said, I don't want them to go back to that. If I'm going to buy them, he made Adam, but he bought us. He said, if I'm going to buy them, I want them to spend all of eternity with us. Well, guess what that meant? We had to become like him. So in order for us to be like, he had to become like us. It's amazing. What is man that thou art mindful of him, that thou would even visit us to him? But then to take it one step further, brother, what is man that thou would pay for our sins? And then one step further, what is man that thou wouldn't just pay for our sins? But you want to give us something better than we were ever supposed to be. What are you saying, brother Jordan? When we think about Christmas, I'm happy he came. But just truly think, what if God saved you to put you back in the garden? could have done it he's God he can do whatever he wants the Bible tells me one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth it's going to be a new Jerusalem well what's going to happen there God could have made another garden said you're in charge of this part of the garden you're in charge of this part of new Jerusalem we could have been servants forevermore that's what Adam was. he served God by keeping the garden Adam wasn't this superhuman rag. He wasn't, you know, running around like superheroes and flying and everything. He's just a man. Just like us, only for a while he didn't have sin because God didn't put it in him. Adam was made out of the same stuff we are, dust of the earth. It just never gave out. How long was Adam in the garden? Don't know. Doesn't matter to us, God would have told us. But as long as he was there, he was just as God made him. And God could have chosen to make us just some farmers, some gardeners. But see, what should really blow our... It blew David's mind that God would even entertain the idea of us. What is man that thou art mindful of? Lord, why didn't you just wipe us off the face of the earth and start all over again? Why do you put up with our sinfulness and our silliness and, Lord, our unfaithfulness? Man's without excuse to look around and know that everything that is made isn't made by anything else that we can see had to be made by a divine creator man's very soul knows that there's a God because God breathed into man the breath of life and that's when man became a living soul you know what made Adam different than everything else God put God's breath into him gave him a soul that's why God chose to make him head over everything else because God made Adam different you realize out of all of heaven, all of earth, there's only one thing that had a soul, Adam. The angels have no souls. But they were made eternal. That's why God had to make hell a place to punish the devil and his angels for eternal, for eternity. What are you saying, Brother John? God could have made us into farmers. Why he even thought about us, I can't understand. But why didn't he just send us back to the garden? I don't know, but I'm thankful that he didn't. Right? When I think about Jesus coming, I've been studying out some, we've been doing apologetics, is the fancy name for it, in the teens class on Sunday nights. I had the teens write down on paper so that nobody knew what everybody else wrote down. Just questions about the Bible. Something as simple as how do you explain this to somebody else that's never been to church? Right? I still haven't. I figured out that it was Seth because when I read it, he smiled. It's going to take us about nine weeks to get through it. But Seth wants to know the entire timeline of the end times. Okay. Buckle up. It only lasts seven years, but it may take us about seven years to get through it, Seth. So thank you for that. Right? But why, why did the Lord burden me to do it? Because if I can't explain to you what I believe, do I really believe it? Truly, faith is believing what you can't see in. That's what the Bible says. Essence of things hoped for, substance of things not seen. 
I can believe it, but until I can explain it, that means it hadn't become a part of me. I can believe that Jesus went to the cross, but you know when I truly believed it enough to take action on it? After conviction had gotten a hold of me through the Holy Ghost, and He had purposed in my heart, in my very soul, that I needed what Jesus was offering. That's when faith became real. That's why James said, I'll show you my faith by more, because he believed it so much he had to do it. He wasn't doing it hoping to get because he had already received, he was doing because it meant that much to him. But see, when I believed upon Christ, he became a part of me. Adam never had that. Jesus could have saved me, killed the flesh on the spot. You know, he could have written it in... I mean, Go read Luke 2. He could send angels down to give the message that Jesus has come, born of a virgin, died, paid the sin debt for everyone else, and then went back to glory. But he didn't choose to do it that way. But he could have. And everybody that believed what the angels were talking about, he could have saved them, killed the flesh, put them back in the new Garden of Eden. In their souls. He could have. But he didn't. What did he do? Well, he took somebody that should have been a husbandman, a gardener, a keeper of a vineyard, and what did he do? Well, first he adopted them. You know what adoption truly means? It means that you want to take something that's not a part of you, make it a part of you, and make sure nobody can take it away. Legally, adoption is unreversible. If you adopt a child, you can't write that child out of your will. Because you went through the whole process and before a judge proclaimed, Lord, or not Lord, judge, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, whatever I've got to do to prove that this child deserves and needs to be a part of this family, I'll do it. And you swore to a judge that more than anything, you wanted that child to be yours. Legally. And you know what the judge said? Okay. We're going to draft up this thing called a legal document. And we're going to file it and we're going to keep it away. And it's going to be in like triplicate and everything else. And it's probably going to be scanned into a computer. And we're going to keep a copy in a fireproof safe. You know why they do that? So that there's always a record that the state recognized. By the power of the state, that child belongs to this couple and nobody can ever take that child away from the parents. Well, you know whose authority God adopted you on? His. You know what that means? No way that you're ever not a part of the family. His only begotten Jesus broke fellowship with the Father. God turned His back on Him when He laid the iniquity and the sin of all mankind for all of eternity onto Him on the cross. That's why God blocked the Son out. So that man wouldn't be able to see what the Son of God had become. And he turned his back. That's why he cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He said, by God, by God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew why. But he cried, Lord, why hast thou turned thy back? So that he could promise us he'd never leave us nor forsake us. He promised we'd never have to go through what the very Son of God went through so that you could be adopted. He didn't send you back to the garden. No, he gave you a title. What's that? A joint heir. That means everything that he owns, you own. You know what Adam owned? Nothing. He didn't own the earth. God told him to keep the earth. Why? Because God owned it. You know what we own once we get to all of eternity? Everything that Jesus owns. Adam didn't own anything except skin on his back. I believe he didn't want anything else. But you know what we received because of adoption? Everything that Jesus owned. Well, what's that? Well, after he wipes off the earth with a fervent heat, melts it away, he throws hell into the lake of fire. You know what everything left over is going to be? Ours. Why? Because it's his. 
joint. It means he made us a part of him. He didn't just become a part of That's what adoption means. We're a part of him. But then, we got birthed into the family. What's it, well, when somebody's birthed into a family, you got to name them something. It's new. You can adopt someone that's not a new baby. Okay, but a birth, that's something new. I don't know what my name is going to be in heaven, but God does that enough. I got a feeling that God's going to give me a name in a language that I currently do not speak. But I know what we're going to look like. We're going to look like Jesus. The Bible says that we'll be known as we were known. I believe I'm not even going to have to ask you. I'm just going to walk up to you, know who you were. Never, Even if I never met you before, I'm going to know exactly who you are. Why? Because that's what God said it was going to be. And because of that kindred spirit that saved me, that saved that person, when we get to glory, God knew all about me long before he ever saved me. So why wouldn't one of his children know all about me before, you know, when I'd never met him before? When we get there, we're all just going to be family. He gave us a new place to live. In my father's house are many mansions. I still haven't wrapped my head around that. I can't wrap my head around Brother Larry. Go over to Revelation. It gives you the dimensions of New Jerusalem. It tells you how tall the wall is. That wall's not that tall. I'm sure it's going to be a beautiful wall, a very pretty wall, but the wall's not that tall. Then it tells you how tall the city is. That don't make sense to me. How can the city be taller than the wall? Does that mean it's on a big hill? I don't think so. Does that mean that all them houses are stacked up on top of each other? I don't think so. Because if they're all stacked up on top of each other, you, depending on where you are, you may not be able to see Jesus. But well, that's the whole point of the new city. Jesus is front and center. He's the light of the city. Everywhere you go, you're supposed to be able to see Jesus. Well, I don't know what the mansions are made out of. But the streets are pure gold, which means they're as crystal. Maybe it is a skyscraper, and guess what? We could just see through everything because it's made perfect. So that wherever we are, we can see Jesus, even if you're inside. But he's saying, I don't know, but he chose that we were supposed to live there. He didn't make his home on New Earth or in New Jerusalem. Where did he make our home? In the Father's house. And he said, everybody gets a mansion. What's that mean? That's a permanent place of residence. He didn't say, I'll give you a tent and come and visit, but you got to sleep on the back 40. No, he said, I'm going to make you the best place that there can be because you're staying here for how long? Eternity. Now, I don't know, maybe after a million or a billion years or so, we may choose to go down to... Jesus may say, hey, let's take a field trip down to New Jerusalem. I don't know. But if he does, you know what that means? We all going with him. But you know where we're always going back to? Home. And it's not his home, it's our home. See, we got adopted, we got born, we got... One of these days, the marriage supper of the Lamb will get married in. That can't happen until all them saints, so You know, are become saints. When's that going to be? I don't know. Jesus don't know, according to the Bible, only the Father knows. When's it going to happen? When it happens. But in the meantime... When we got married, or one of these days we do, to the Lord, you know what He's going to promise us? What's mine is yours. And you know what we'll promise Him? What's mine is His. What's that mean? Again, everything He has, we one day will own it with Him. We'll give it all back to Him, cast it at His feet. So it's not because of our righteousness or the works that we did but we cast it to him you realize that in order for us to even go to heaven and cast the treasures that we stored up in this life that we stored up in heaven when he bestows them to us and we throw it back at his feet you realize that in order to even do that God had to let us get to heaven in the first place man was never meant to be in heaven man's supposed to be on the earth but because Jesus loved you so much he didn't come to make a new Eden. 
He came so that you would be with Him, not just in the cool of the day, but for all of eternity. He didn't want any separation to where when He went back to glory to take care of what God's got to take care of. Well, what's He got to take care of? Well, according to the Bible, by Him and through Him do all things consist. He's in charge of everything. And then, if we really want to blow people's minds, I can't prove that this is the only dimension that God has. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, what was before the beginning? The alpha of time. What was God doing back then? I don't know. What's He got planned after the book of Revelation ends? I don't know. But you know what I do know? Wherever He goes, we with Him. Wasn't that way back in the garden. See, a lot of people, truly, and been there, done that, we take for granted some of the privileges that we have as a child of God. We think because we're saved that we have rights to certain things. All we had rights to was death and hell. But even if you take it a step further and say, well, what if he just made us like Adam and Eve? All right, you want to be a gardener for all of eternity? Yeah, you're going to live in a sinless environment. You could have lived in a place where all, everything that God made. Well, what did God make that sin is ruined? Well, there's a bunch of extinct animals out there that we know about. I don't know how many got extincted during the flood. But I do know that what is around today, this is the leftover cursed version of what God made. And yet we can still go to some of the places on this sin-cursed earth and see wonders of natural beauty. Grand Canyon. I'd like to go out and see the Laurentian Abyss in a submarine one day. You know what that is? That's the deepest point on earth. Deepest spot. It's so deep that Mount Everest could fit in it three times. Why'd God make that part of I don't know, but He had a purpose for it. Maybe that's one of them leftovers from where God, over in Noah's day, He broke up the foundations of the deep and that's where that water came out of. And that bench just left over. I don't know. I said, Brother Jordan, you don't know a lot. Yeah. But you know what I do know? He didn't want me to go back to that. He could have. It is that I've saved you. You're saved for all of eternity. Your soul can't sin anymore. Now go stay in the garden. And we could have sang praises to him because why? He's worthy of praise. We could have cried, holy, holy. We may have been able to see him up on his throne, but we wouldn't have been with him. We'd have been here and he'd have been there. That's what he could have done. He could have demoted us and said, well, because Adam wasn't what he was supposed to be. Right? Man's lost the privilege of being the gardener, the husbandman. Instead, y'all just going to sit here and behave. He's God. He could do whatever He wanted to. And we're not. You know what that means? We'd have liked it. He could have taken away free choice from us. But you know what He said? No. I love Him so much that I'm not just going to pay for Him. I want them to be like me for all of eternity. I want them to be a child of God. I want them to be birthed into the family, adopted into the family, married into the family to prove that when God does it, He does it right and He does it for eternity. But through all of it, do we really realize that when He saved us, all those benefits, that we, we don't even entertain the idea that God doesn't know about us. Why? Because He indwells in me. I know He's with me. He's everywhere I go, and everywhere I go, He's already waiting on me. He's omnipresent. He's all-knowing, and through the Spirit, He leads and guides me into all truth. But see, I know what that's like because God intended that after I got saved, that the Holy Ghost would come. Jesus said that it is better for Him to go away and the Holy Ghost to come. Do you realize that Adam didn't know what it was like to have God with him all the time. But Brother Jordan, he was sinless, but he wasn't sealed with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost didn't indwell him. 
He's just flesh. And when God went around, he was supposed to be tending in the garden. And then when God showed up, that's when he had fellowship. You know when I have fellowship? Whenever I take the time to get in the right spirit, to worship him in spirit and in truth. When I humble myself and call upon the name of God. When I sacrifice and get the time, not just to read, but to truly study the word of God. And he speaks to me from his word. I have fellowship whenever I want it. Because he wanted fellowship with me for all of eternity. So I was supposed to pray without ceasing. So that whenever we need to, that line of communication is open. Whenever he desires to speak to us, there's nothing between me and him that would prevent him from speaking to me. You realize that even in a sinless and perfect state, Adam couldn't call upon God whenever Adam wanted to because that was God and he was Adam but he tells us we have that privilege today because of what Christ did for us he could have put us right back in the garden but he didn't in fact it's promised one of these days this is what really irritates and angers the devil see the devil believed that he was worthy to sit on God's throne that his name should have been higher than the name of Jesus. Now according to your Bible, he was the most lovely of all the angels. He was in charge of the music in heaven. Said that he was full of instruments. Not quite sure what that means. But God made him to where he can make whatever sound and whatever music needed to be in heaven that day. And I believe he made the most beautiful music that's ever been heard in heaven. Why? Because that's what he was created to do. But he believed that the thing that made heaven great was himself. And he wanted to sit upon the throne that's in the side of the north. And he convinced a third of the angels that he deserved it too. And they believed him. What did he want? He wanted to sit where Jesus sat. Where the Father sat. Well, guess what? According to your Bible, one day is going to happen. We're going to sit on his throne with him. You know why the devil hates you? Because we get to do the very thing that he's wanted to do since the beginning of time. Since before history was recorded, he desired to be where God... Guess what? We get to. Do we deserve it? No. Is that what God created Adam to do initially? No. But he loved you enough to pay for you and enough to change you to make you into what he is why so that things like sin and flesh and eternity and time and space and separation that none of that could get in the way of you and Christ together for all of eternity when he came he removed all obstacles between us that's what the realized perfection one day we will be. But you know what he did in the meantime? You have more right now in this thing that you can't get rid of yet called flesh. You have more connection to God than Adam ever did in the garden. What is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that he'd even think about making us more than what we were supposed to be? Well, he's just supposed to be gardeners. You know what Cain and Abel had to learn how to do? Well, Cain learned how to be a gardener. You know what Abel learned how to do? He became a shepherd. You know what Abel figured out that Cain never did? If you do it God's way, it always works out. You know what Abel didn't realize until Jesus came and purchased him with a price? He had heard all them stories. Now Adam had told him about how he named everything that was named because God told him to. He got to hear stories of what Adam used to be before sin entered into him and brought him this thing called death and how Abel had death passed upon him because through one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so through one man, death passed upon all men. Sin passed upon all men. 
Abel got to hear about what the garden was like. Abel got to hear about what it was like to walk with God in the cool of the day. And even though God came down, I believe that God still visited, but it wasn't the same. Because when God talked to Cain after Cain slew Abel, I don't find that that was a pleasant, you know, person-to-person, face-to-face conversation. Adam walked with God. Face-to-face. Even Noah, who the Bible says that God talked to Noah out of the cloud face-to-face as a friend. Not Noah, Moses. Moses couldn't see him. It was that cloud. There was the veil, the fog in between. As much as God wanted to talk to Moses face-to-face, Moses couldn't see him and live. When Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, he didn't see him the way that God was in the garden. Because God shone out in perfection and holiness. And Adam could stand to see him that way because he didn't have sin-cursed flesh. His eyes weren't cursed by sin. His body wasn't cursed by sin. Death hadn't passed upon him. Entered into him yet. Abel had heard all of that. But do you realize until Abel got saved, he never realized truly what Jesus had intended for him? He thought, well, we're going, God one day is going to send a lamb. I wonder if Abel thought, well, he's going to put us back in the garden. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be a perfect environment. But when Jesus walked into Abraham's bosom one day into paradise, preaching redemption, showing them the blood that he had just saved for him or shed for him, all them Old Testament sayings got saved. You know what Abel realized when the blood was applied? He got a whole lot more than he bargained for. What is man that God would care? What is man that God would even entertain giving us more than we were ever created for? The love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God can be sung about until we're blue in the face. If truly our minds can't comprehend how much he really loved us. I believe he loved Adam because he made him in his own image. But you know how much he loved you? Enough that you got more than Adam was ever supposed to be. More than Adam was ever supposed to have. You know what Adam had? Himself. And God gave him Eve, his wife, as a help me. And they became one flesh. They were together. They were one. They had each other. But they didn't have the earth. They didn't have a home. They didn't have a place that was theirs. You know what? I got a mansion with my name on it. You know what I got? I'm seated in heavenly places. Bible tells you, I've got a chair somewhere in heaven that God's reserved for me and says, when Jordan gets here, put him right there. All right? Fine with that. You realize that during the millennial reign, he's already got a job for you to do for him. But then think, if he's got a job for me to do something, if he's got a place for me for all of eternity, he's got a place for you right now and a job for you to do right now. We like to throw off on Adam. Well, if he had been keeping the garden, the serpent wouldn't have been in the garden. We like to throw off on him. He only had one job. Yeah, but how many of us can't even do less than that in our daily Christian life? You say, well, he couldn't even do one job. Adam didn't have all the benefits you had. What's your excuse? You know what David's saying? What is man that thou art mindful of? Lord, you know we're going to fail you. Why do you even waste your time with us? Can't understand it. But God says, I suffer long by choice so that you can receive mercy and grace. He says, I'm mindful of you because I love you. And because I love you, I'm going to make sure that you're where you need to be. Why would God save you and leave you all on your own? If you're not where God wants you to be today, it's not God's fault. If we're falling short of the mark that He set for us, 
It's not God's fault. It's our fault. Maybe we just need to humble ourselves and say, what, it, what am I that God would even think about me? That God would visit me? God would choose to reside in me? That God would establish a place where I could be with Him for all of eternity? That He promised that He, being with me, He'd be strong enough to take care of all the things I can. Then told me to cast my cares upon Him that I could bear around with me. But I cast them on Him because I want to take up His cross and follow after Him. He promised that no temptation would come to me except that is common to man. What's that mean? That I can bear it. Because if it's too much, He won't let the devil tempt me with it. What is man that thou art mindful of? What is man that you would make us more than what we were ever supposed to be? And around this time of year, we forget He was born to die. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He took His first breath so that you could be more than Adam was ever supposed to be. So that you could be with Him for all of eternity. And we remember that around this time of year. But when it's hot and when it's hard and when things get heavy, we forget that He loved us enough to go through all of this. And we take our nose away from the grindstone and we don't take up our cross and follow after Him. You know what we do? We trample the blood underneath of our feet. We mock the day that He took on flesh because the devil can go and say, He doesn't love you as much as you loved Him. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Forms app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.